We are here today to do a life oral history on Roy Schelling. This is September 10th, 2007. We're at the IIS studio in Springfield, Illinois. And I'm Chris Reynolds. I am a volunteer for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. And that's who we're doing this, this oral history uh, for. Uh, Roy here is a resident, currently a resident of Decatur, Illinois. And we're going to talk about his entire life, so why don't we just get started here, Roy. Um, tell me what you know about your family background, your parents, siblings, grandparents, any aunts and uncles and cousins you want to kind of talk about. Give us kind of the lay of the land of your family uh, as we start. That's going to be a long story, Chris. Well, give me what you can. Okay. I'd like to start with first of my great-grandparents, Sheila. My great-grandfather was named John, born April 13th. 1808 in Württemberg, Germany. He died July 11th in 1890 in Pike County, Ohio. He was married to Margaret Zwicker, who was born November the 25th, 1819, also in Württemberg, okay. Germany. And she died at a very early age on April 25th, 1967. Mm -hmm. The family came to America in 1825. They had six children, and one of the reasons that great-grandfather John came was because at that time all 17-year-old youth were conscripted into the army. So many of them came to escape that. What year would that have been? 1924? Yeah, well, they came in 1825. 1825. He, he was 17 years okay, old. Okay, 18. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, then uh, the grandparents Schilling uh, was named, my grandfather named George, he was born on April 27, 1843 in Waverly, Ohio, which is Pike County, okay. right on the Sauer River. Right. Uh, grandmother Ham was Margaret Hammond. She was born on February 21, 1845, also it, in um, Pike County. Uh, she died on May 15, 1920. They were married on August 30, 1866, and had 14 children in Ohio. Lived, in Ohio, 11 yeah. of them grew to, to adulthood. Wow. That family, the Schilling family, came in 1824. Okay. Uh, grandfather had a very misfortune. He was uh, 86 years old, and he was still working as a farmhand in in near Waverly Pike, Ohio, and he went out to collect his money one day in November. Of 19, December 19th, 1928, and coming back, he chose to walk the railroad tracks rather than the road, and he was killed by a train. Oh boy! So now we go to grandparents uh, uh, Van Fossen, my mother's family. My grand, great grandfather. I'm sorry here. My great-grandparent, Van Fossen, named Zacchaeus, was born in Jackson County, Ohio in 19, uh, I don't know, I have his birthday, but he died in 1914 in Redfield, Kansas. Uh -huh. His wife was Rachel House, born January the 3rd, 1846 in Gran Granville, Ohio, and she died in September 1933 in Morton, Illinois. They're both buried in the Elkhart Cemetery. Oh, okay. Uh, both my great-grandparents Van Fossen and grandparents Van Fossen are buried in Elkhart, Illinois. So they moved to Illinois? Well, they came from, uh, they, they came first to Illinois and then they went to Kansas. Oh, okay. And Grandpa died in Kansas, but Grandma came back to Illinois. And they had just four children. My uh, grandfather was Wilson, one of the four children. There were two boys and two girls, uh -huh. uh, Wilson, Lindsay. Uh, May and Mary. Uh, Grandpa Wilson Van Fossen was born November the 23rd, 1869 uh, in Jackson County, Ohio, and he died on September the 1st, 1926 uh, on a farm near Cornland, Illinois. Oh, okay. And we'll talk about that later because he lived right. on Governor Overby's farm at the time he died. Okay. Uh, there were six children in that family. Uh, no, my grandmother Van Fossen named Ida Elgio, born January 3rd, 1869 in Middletown, Illinois. And there were seven children in that family. Mm -hmm. 
and she died October 7, 1957, Imperia. And again, she's buried in Elkhart Cemetery. There were 10 children. My mother was the oldest of 10. Boy, when I did ask you to talk about all the <laughs> cousins so and see, aunts and uncles. Well, I had 40 cousins on my, about 40 cousins on my oh children's my. side. And I counted them up the other day, and I had something like 35 uh, Van Fossen children. Some of them I never did see. Right, right. I did have, uh, I did meet one when he was 65 years old. Now, that brings me up to my parents. Okay. Just well, the, the occupations of the grandparents. Well, farmers for the most part? Uh, or? They were all farmers except the great grandfather was named, uh, he was a cooper. Yeah. And I didn't know what a cooper was, but I asked today some people and said they made barrels. Oh, okay. Now, what they made barrels for, I don't know, but that was oh, his job. That, that was the rest essential were, commodity. I the imagine. rest of them were all farmers. Right, right. Well, my father was born on September 22nd, 1883, at Waverly, Ohio. Okay. And uh, grandmother, or my mother, uh, grandmother, I'm sorry, he came to Illinois, where he had two sisters, uh, to Elkhart, Illinois, in 1901, at age 17. Yeah. And... Uh, he was a farmer, right? And we can talk about that a little bit later. But he was a what you might call in that day a big farmer, yeah. Because uh, we farmed four in the acres. Yeah. Uh, mother was born in Peoria, Illinois, uh, and uh, they were married on uh, February the twenty-sixth, nineteen thirteen, here in Springfield by Judge uh, Jenkins. Okay. Now I, see. They didn't have church wedding in those days. They just came down from Elkhart one day and met. Why Judge would they not have gotten married in Elkhart, you think? Just because a well, uh, bigger nobody, church in well, Springfield? Well, they had or? ministry in Elkhart, but I don't know. They just chose to come to Springfield. Okay. Maybe it was a little nicer place to have a wedding and, and a reception. They, they went to housekeeping in a very little little farm out west of, uh, east of Elkhart, about four miles, a very small farm, Timberland. Right. They lived there one year, and in 19... 14, they moved uh, to a farm three and a half miles west of Elkhart, an 80-acre farm. Uh -huh. And that's where my twin brother Ray and I were born. Okay. And I brought a picture of, uh, well, let me go back. This is a picture of my uh, grandmother Schilling. She was one of 12, and wow. I knew her. Yeah. And uh, that's, the, uh, that's the Hammond family, but that's my grandmother there. Uh-huh. And then the picture of And this the, is, uh, what year would that picture This be picture taken? was made in 1888 on their 50th wedding anniversary. Oh, okay. And most uh -huh. of them lived to be in their 80s. Right. Then this is the picture. It's a family tradition to live a long time, it looks like. Yes. I uh, don't have a picture of my great-grandparents Schilling, but this is a picture of my grandparents mm -hmm. in this one here. Okay. And that's my father there. Okay. Um, two of the boys weren't there. Uh, I won't go into why they weren't there, but uh, okay, <laughs> there was a reason. Okay, <laughs> and then this is my own family. Okay, this is your mom and dad and the mom four, and dad, four and sons, four brothers, right? Two brothers, and then this is when taken in 1918. Uh -huh. uh, Ray and I were on the horses out on the farm, and mm -hmm. you were a twin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you're, uh, uh, but your twin brother is no longer alive, as I recall. Well. That's a long story, but my twin brother was a great guy. Yeah. Uh, he went to Blackburn College after he finished high school in Elkhart, and uh, his health was not good. We had scarlet fever. Right. And following scarlet fever. Both of you had it as, a, as children? Both of you had scarlet uh, fever as children? Or? Yeah, we had scarlet yeah. fever twice. Right. Okay. And uh, following that, we had rheumatic fever. So at age 16, uh, I was so ill with scarlet fever that I spent the entire summer, yeah. age 16, in, uh, in, in bed. Right. And uh, his case of scarlet fever was not that bad, so he kept going and kept going and kept going, and he farmed and uh, ran a big dairy. Uh, but finally, uh, he had uh, permanent damage and right. uh, died at age 34. Right. He died, by the way, in Springfield. Did he? He and his wife. Was he uh, living in Springfield? or No, they were living in Lincoln, and he and yeah. his wife and baby, a uh, seven months old baby boy, were visiting a friend named Copper uh -huh. here in Springfield. I they see. live in Lincoln. Yeah. He was the, uh, he had sold life insurance, he farmed, he had this big dairy and elk cart for a number of years, but he, his last job was uh, 
director, uh, membership director, organization director of the Logan Kai Farm Bureau. Oh, okay. And he supervised student. Uh, right. He supervised. We're talking uh, about your twin brother right now. He supervised right. uh, all the Hoyas Cubs. Right. And right. he died suddenly. Yeah. Uh, at a, in October 16, 1948. Right. Um, how about your other siblings? Are they? Uh, well, they both farmed. Okay. Are they both alive or? Uh, well, Harold was born in September the 22nd, 1917. We moved from the 80-acre farm to a 160-acre farm owned by Mr. Patrick Bowen. That was four and a half miles west of Elkhart. Right. And he, um, uh, the baby brother, Junior, uh, was born November the 4th, 1919, uh, and he is now deceased. Yeah. Uh, my brother Harold, well, we're going to be observing his ninth birthday next Sunday. Wow! I met Harold, and yeah, you met Harold. He looks to be in very good health. He, um, he still. When we moved to, we moved from the farm west of Elkhart on November, March the first, nineteen twenty-one. Four hundred eighty acres. Yeah. We did all the farm by horses. Wow. We had eighteen head of horses, two riding ponies, and a, a Shetland pony. Right. Uh, but um, your your father was a farmer pretty much his entire life. You know, all of his life. Yeah. He first farmed and uh, he owned a, he ran operated a farm near Middletown, Illinois. Right. And then he came to Elkhart. But so we lived on that farm from 19 to March 1st, 1921. My parents lived there. Now this is the bottom of Elkhart Hill, a mile and a half, mile and one quarter east of Elkhart. Uh -huh. It was all we had a hundred we had 80 acres of timberland. Uh, but an 480-acre farm in those days was a big farm. Right. And to do it all by horses was something else. Right. Did you hire people to help you we with had, it, or we usually had um, we had hired men. We had a hired girl. Right. Because mother was busy, you know, uh, keeping track of the kids and doing the home front, huh? Well, it was uh, Harold has been going to that farm. My parents lived on that farm. It was by Dr. Barnes. Right. Mrs. Barnes was a gov sister of Mrs. Oglesby. Right. And she's owned the farm. And my parents lived there 25 years. Then my brother lived there uh, until 1974. And then his son lived there. And now his grandson oh, is wow. there. Oh, wow. Still farming. So the farm's been there. We've been on that farm since. But, but you were owners of the farm, or were you farming the it farm, for the Barnes family? The farm family? was owned by Mrs. Charlotte Barnes, Dr. Okay. Barnes. Okay. Okay. Who was a founder of Decatur Memorial Hospital? Okay, and the connection to the Oglesby family. I know we'll get back to this in a later interview, but what's the connection to the Barnes that through Mrs. marriage they're Mrs. connected? Mrs. Oglesby was the oldest of the Gillette girls, right? And Mrs. Barnes was the youngest one, right? Okay, and um, they had big farmland, right? Okay, um, okay. I think we kind of got got all your family sort of, although we didn't get into the aunts and uncles and the cousins, but we'd be here a long time if we tried to get into that. <laughs> well, uh, I, but I, that's, that's, that's fine. I, as far as I had, uh, they were all wonderful all right, uncles. Right. Right. Let's just kind of talk about your childhood, memories of childhood. You know, uh, it sounds like you lived in maybe one place, and, uh, uh, but talk about the, the churches and the people that you knew and, and uh, maybe your elementary school experiences, friends, the kind of things you did in Elkhart, that kind of thing. Well, being and I'm assuming you lived in, you were born in uh -huh. Elkhart. Did I get that right? On a farm four, three and a half miles, uh, three Near and Elkhart. a half miles west of Elkhart. And you lived in Elkhart as a child till about when? Till you went away I, to college? I or? lived on the farm with my parents uh, in and out different times until 1943. 1943. I was 29 years old. Okay. And so you I, were there for nearly 30 years. I was 29 years, years old when yeah. I left home. Right. Okay. And uh, never did I ever pay any boarding room. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good deal. Uh, going back to my first year of school, I need a drink of water. <laughs> Did they, um, off, do you have that glass down there? Or? I know, I think you do. Anyway, uh, we, were sp we were born in June. I hate to drink so we this have in front to, of you. <laughs> we need to go to school in September. Well, Maple Grove School, which is 20 miles north of Springfield, yeah. on the, make, on the uh, Menard and Logan County line. Right. That's where we were supposed to go to school. Right. But when my folks found out that we were going to be going, moving from west of town to east of town in March the 1st, uh, they said, we're not going to send those boys to a country school and have them changed to a village school. And uh, 
So uh, we didn't get to go, and I was very upset yeah. because I had learned, my parents, they were very much interested in education. They taught us how to, uh, they, we knew the days of the week, the months of the year, and we could write our numbers to 100. Right. We didn't read, but we did all that. We could tell time. So I was so kind of homeschooled to an extent. It, well, they were they were both interested. Right. Now they were not. My father went. I think he told me one time he went ten years to school without missing a single day. But my mother only finished about eighth grade. Yeah. And by the way, she was te she was they lived she lived at Williamsville. Oh, okay. And went to school out by Williamsville. That's where she grew up. Uh, so anyway, we didn't get to start the school in until uh, September of 1921 okay. in Elkhart. Okay. And we had, and I can remember the first day of school. In teaching classes at Milliken University, I would often ask my students, "Do you remember your first day of school?" They didn't. Yeah. I I could not believe it. Yeah. I remember my first day of school as if it were yesterday. Yeah. And uh, I still see. Was it a good day or a bad day? <laughs> well. Couldn't wait to go. Yeah. And my father took my twin brother and me in a buggy and a horse named Sport to town, and he did not know we were not going to be there all day, so right. he just went home. Well, we had our little bucket lunches, right. and after we got our assignment of school supplies, school was dismissed about 9.30. Yeah. So we were determined to eat our lunches, so we went out <laughs> on the tree and sat down to eat our lunches. Yeah. Yeah. Walked home a mile and a quarter. And on the way home, a neighbor boy who was high school and a friend of his picked us up. His name was Walter Lee. And they asked us a question which I could not answer. And the question was, did you whisper? I never heard of the word. I did not know what whisper meant. <laughs> so anyway, we, we walked to school. We rode our ponies. You, you were going to learn how to whisper in school, huh? <laughs> well, I learned a lot about <laughs> that. We walked to school. We rode the ponies. We drove the ponies to buggy. Uh, we went. In bad weather, my father would take us in a lumber wagon, yeah. and um, it was we had a good life. Right. Now, was this a, uh, a multiple s a room school, or what uh, was my the? My first two years were spent in the old building, which is right, right. It's, it sits in a pasture okay. across the street from the main part of town. Right. The pasture is owned by uh, John Gillette okay. uh, and his family. Uh, the first building was uh, we went to was a big, tall brick building uh, built in 1865. Okay. And um, did they have everyone separated by grades or? Uh, they had one room downstairs for first, second grade. Then we had a third, fourth, and fifth grade downstairs. And upstairs we had seventh, eighth. Okay. And in 1923, they built the school which stands today. Okay. And that's where we went to the rest of our school. Right. And then in high school. We had a high school organized in 1920, and so this high school was built in 19, I think 1924, right? Maybe 1923, and that's where we went to high school. Okay. Um, you remember any of the teachers that stood every, out in your mind every, during that, every those one years? Of, every one of them. Every don't one want to slight them. any of them by everyone. By I, a, well, selecting a particular you know, teacher. They each had their own good things about them. Uh, I didn't have. You probably didn't. How many teachers in elementary school did you have over the whole course of the well, I eight had, years or I nine miss, years? I had Miss Miss Ellen Hickey in first, second grade, and she was a wonderful teacher. I had Miss Agnes Hickey in third grade. I had Miss Ruth Sweet in fourth, third, or fourth, fifth grade, and she is the one that made me want to be a teacher. Yeah, that's what I was kind of getting at. Since you ended up an educator, there and, must have been one that really impressed say, you. Well, why? Why Miss Sweet? Well, she did things other than just teach us writing arithmetic. Reading. At lunchtime, we'd take our bucket and sack lunches and go up to the hill uh, right. where the John Gillette home was, right. and we'd study the flowers and the birds and the trees right. and have our picnics. Just, just briefly, and we're going to talk about the Gillettes probably later, but just a, a brief side of who the who the Gillette was and. And John Dean Gillette came from, I think, New York State in about 1840 sometime and uh, uh, became a very uh, prosperous uh, cattle raiser. Right. He raised big, head, big herds of cattle. Right. And uh, so he, uh, he, was, he was the first 
cattle breeder in the United States that would ship cattle to Europe. And he, in uh, at the at the world at the world's uh, at the uh, big cattle show in Chicago, he was named the Cattle King of America. Right. This would have been. Late 1800s? Eight, yeah. About 1885. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. And he lived at the top of the hill in Elkhart yes. and obviously owned a lot of the... I have a picture of the... Uh, no, I don't have a picture of that. Well, we'll talk about Elkhart yeah. a little later, yeah. but I just wanted to kind of, since you mentioned him, we'll, we'll uh, let people know what, well, in, who he was. Well, in high school, I uh, say uh, grade school was a, a real blessing. Uh, we were always glad when the weather got bad because yeah. uh, if the weather was too bad to go home, uh, well, we we rented a barn in town to put our ponies in the barn because my two brothers rode the Shetland pony and we rode the Indian pony. Uh, but across the street, right across the street from the grade school was Uncle Lindsay and Aunt Mary Van Fossen. Uncle Lindsay was my mother's uncle and my and Aunt Mary was my dad's sister. Okay. And I tell this story, maybe I can tell it right. So that's where my parents met. Yeah. Mother would want to visit her uncle and aunt and dad wanted to visit his sister and brother-in-law. Yeah. So when they got married, I hope I can tell this right, dad became a uh, nephew to his sister, and my mother became a sister-in-law to her uncle. <laughs> okay, okay. There Follow you. that? Yeah, yeah. And they were one over So yeah. in bad weather, we got to stay all night with them. Right, right. Um, do you remember any big events in town during your elementary years, any cultural well, or social events that maybe occurred uh, in Elkhart? I'd like to mention something about what I did in school. First. Oh, absolutely. I, uh, of course, we had good teachers. Right. And uh, I did oratory. Okay. And I was successful in being able to represent our school in oratory. And This uh, has been in high school, probably. Yeah, in, yeah. in high school. All right. And then we also participated in uh, school plays. Right. One of our great teachers, and we had great ones. Right. One of them was uh, Julia Bach Miller Harwood. Yeah. Uh, Judy Bach Harwood Miller. She uh, became a world traveler and lecturer. Yeah. And uh, we had a great experience with her. Wow. What was her uh, expertise in, or what was, uh, why did she become famous? Well, uh, she, I think mainly because she, uh, after she taught good marriage, she decided she just wanted to be a traveler. Yeah. And she had an agent. And she traveled. She spoke to the congressman and the state legislator oh, okay. and school. Uh, Did she have a cause that she was speaking about, or just uh, her travels? Her travels. Okay. You see, in those days, people didn't travel like they do today. Right. Right. So she would travel and mm -hmm. then lecture about the places she'd mm -hmm. been to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anything else about your school experience you wanna you wanna you wanna remember well, or wanna talk about? Or um, you were on the debate. Club no, or no, it was just or oratory, oratory yeah, it was uh, called. Uh, uh, you said you did some plays. It plays. Do you uh, remember any of the plays that you one were was in? One called or? Seventeen. The other was called Minnick. Okay. And Minnick was about a, an old man who had some problems, and my aunt Mary didn't like it because she thought it was not being very respectful of old people. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, we had a terrible tragedy in our, our senior year. Yeah. Uh, our class was small. And uh, in December 5th, 1932, two of our senior classmates were killed in a car train crash oh, in wow. Elkhart. Yeah. And that was a sad thing. A car train, the car was hit by a train? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, which reminds me, did you know that the depression, I mean, did you sense the depression was going on? Had it affected everybody in Elkhart in some way or another? Or, and how did it affect you? Uh, since you would have been right at the heart of the depression right then. You know, <clears throat> uh, we we usually had a homecoming in December, and it, because of the uh, tragic death of our two c classmates, the right. the, uh, the homecoming was uh, postponed to March, March the fourth, nineteen thirty three, and that was the day that uh, President Roosevelt closed all the banks. Yeah. So that night at the oyster stew, nobody had any money. Yeah. None. So How many banks were there in Elkhart at that point? We had one. One. And Never did reopen. Never did reopen. Uh, Was there a run on the bank in Elkhart, do you recall? Yep. Yep. One man lost $28,000. Wow. Michael Ryan. Right. Uh, I'm guessing that the Gillettes and the Barnes and other families they, probably they, had their money somewhere else. or They did very well. Yeah, right. Because uh, I don't like to say these stories, but what they did 
Yeah. One of the Gillette girls would loan money to the farmers. Yeah. And they couldn't pay it back, so she'd foreclose and take the farm. Yeah. And that was hard. Right. Uh, in a sense, we didn't know we had a depression because we grew our own uh, on the farm. We had all of our vegetables and right. potatoes and hogs and sheep right. and cattle. Right. We would butcher a hog. We'd butcher cattle knock in November, and that lasts until February. Right. And then in February, we'd butcher four four hogs. Yeah. So and then by the time then we'd have 500 chickens. Yeah. And uh, chickens would come to to eat about uh, August when we had the. Uh, uh, corn on the cob and fresh right, tomatoes. Right. <laughs> so you don't remember it ever really affecting the financial status of your family? Well, in 1933 you know. was when the Big Depression hit us. Right. And I remember uh, Father had uh, had finished harvesting the wheat crop, and he was afraid that the wheat crop was going to be lost in the bank, uh, the elevator failure. And I remember saying, you know, if neither, if if both Ray and I can't go to school, I'm going to be the one to go because I felt like my health was not too good. Right. And uh, so I went to Illinois State University in 1933, right. and uh, Ray went to Carlville, right. Blackburn College. Okay. But knowing how hard it was for my parents to provide for us, right. I, I kept a very accurate record of my uh, expenses. Yeah. And. Uh, just recently, I threw away the little notebook I kept. Oh, it. yeah. My two years ISU, Illinois State University, Illinois State Normal University, cost less than six hundred dollars. Wow. Well, let, we'll we'll get back to your college years. Let's let's uh, let's kind of talk about uh, Elkhart a little bit okay. and, and the history of Elkhart. Um, and I know you've become sort of a student of the history well, of Elkhart. And going and, back uh, to my preschool days, we. Uh, uh, we were enrolled in the in the cradle roof department of the church, uh, Elkhart Christian Church. Right. The church was very important to us. Right. And uh, we very often, we very seldom did, did not attend church. Right. When we lived west of Elkhart, it was four miles, and we didn't always get there. But when we moved west of, east of town, we could walk or get there. Right. So we were very regular in church. Uh, the 4th of July was a big event. We right. always had a big celebration of Fourth of July, mm -hmm. uh, horse races and horseshoe pitching and picnics, and right. it was great. Right. They Every don't year do in that Elkhart. Anymore. Yeah. No, that doesn't happen much anymore. Um, did Elkhart celebrate its founding fathers uh, in any way over the years, or in 1955, we had a big celebration on the hill. Yes, yeah. a big celebration. Right. Uh, just uh, in 19. Uh, 2005, we celebrated our uh, 100th anniversary. Yeah, be yeah, I guess it would be centennial, it or be was it a bicentennial? Let's see, 19, uh, 2005, I have to stop and think. Yeah. We was founded in 1855. Oh, okay. It would so be 100 years. Yeah, or 150. No, 150 years. Yeah. Yeah, we had a big celebration then, and uh, I didn't bring the picture, but... Um, uh, two women and I uh, served as a panel right. talking about our recollections of oh, our childhood. Okay. And okay. Uh, we uh, talked, uh, one was, ni I was 92 and uh, 91, and one was 91, one was 92. Wow. Uh, Alice McHugh uh, and uh, Margaret Turney Lambert. Did we you go to school with, with uh, both of them? No. Well, hi no, they went with, McC with Alice, we did, yes. Yeah. But Margaret went to Mount Plastic. Oh, okay. So anyway, we talked about our experiences, and uh, my brother, I asked him what he thought, and he said, well, people said they uh, thought maybe a little bit, uh, uh, they, they found it very interesting, all right. and they, some of them thought it a little bit too long, yeah. and others thought maybe they could lessen all night. <laughs> uh, one of the experiences I told there, uh, in 1922 or 23, we had this 80 acres of timber on this 480 acre farm, right. and they cut out 80 walnut trees and sold them for $100 a, head, a tree. Yeah. And then we had a sawmill on the land, uh, the barns did, yeah. and they cut um, cut down all those ash trees, elms, and yeah. oak, and uh, walnut. And that sawmill was on the farm for uh, maybe three or four years. Yeah. Uh, in December of 1928, 
we had 16,000 16, square feet of lumber stacked. Wow. And we had hunters all the time hunting. And one night, for some reason, the lumber yard caught on fire and burned all of it. Oh, boy. It was a big wow. loss. Wow. Um, and there probably was not much they could do about the fire. They just kind of well, let it burn, the, huh? Well, it was 300 feet away from yeah. there, and all you could do is carry a bucket. Yeah. No, we just stood there yeah. and watched it burn. Wow. Yeah. Um, did uh, so the did uh, did several businesses go out of business in Elkhart during the Depression, or and in terms of World War II, were there a lot of uh, men from Elkhart that ended up going to? We to had war a large or? number in World War One, and we had right. a large number in World War Two, big right. number. Right. Um, in World War Two, we lost three local citizens, uh -huh. and in uh, World War Two. I think, as I remember, uh, maybe two or three, right. but not, but uh, right. think, yeah, about three or four. Uh, Wilbur Mann and um, um, he was one of them. Uh, considering all the number we went, it was not too bad. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, now you probably, because of health reasons, were 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 not able to. I was um, teaching. In the war, I was or? teaching sixth grade at Jefferson School in Lincoln, oh, so in, you uh, could and. Uh, September 1940. Yeah. And my number was uh, drawn by the uh, draft. I was number nine in the county. And um, so I had to be examined for the Army on the day after Thanksgiving 1940. Yeah. Uh, an Army doctor examined me, and because of my health reasons, I, I want to go. Yeah. He said, We don't need your kind. Right. So he marked me 4F. Right. Well, you serve the country as a well, teacher, later, too. Later, I tried important. to enlist, and they wouldn't take me. Yeah, yeah. The only one of us three boys that went was Harold. Yeah. And he spent time in uh, uh, in uh, Florida and uh, in right. Ganderfield, Newfoundland. Right, right. Any other big businesses you can think of that didn't make it through the Depression in Elkhart? You, know, you said the El Green Elevator was close well, to bankruptcy? No, or? no, the, the, it made it. It made it. Yeah. You know, to my knowledge... There was not a one of them closed. Wow. The, the grocery stores stayed open, the hardware stayed open, the restaurants stayed open. It's true. Uh, they were forced. Yeah. You right. see, uh, it was a very, uh, you might say, a very prosperous community. Right. And many of the farmers were from Ireland. Right. First time people from Ireland. Right. Primarily a farming community. Mm -hmm. I mean, there wasn't a lot of just Mostly wage and farming. salary people. That farming were, was most, right. that was a big business. Right. Did a lot of people commute to Springfield for work in Elkhart, or? Uh, some of them did, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. but very few, probably. I remember, uh, well, early, uh, a man named John Merritt worked for the, uh, in Springfield, the Chicago Motor Club. Uh -huh. and he, they, yeah, they did. Right. Now, you said at one point there was a train that, that went, uh, sort of almost a, a commuter train that went from Elkhart to uh Well, we had what we call the Illinois Traction System. Yeah. And... Uh, the Illinois Traction System, I've been reading a lot of history on that. Right. The Illinois Traction System was founded by William B. McKinley, born in Petersburg, Illinois. Yeah. And he had a big si system. The Illinois Traction System, it was electric. It ran from uh, uh, Bloomington to St. Louis, uh, wow. Peoria, Champaign, Indianapolis. Yeah. Uh, and they ran almost every hour. Wow. You, it was wow. A, uh, one single car. Yeah. And uh, when we wanted to go to the doctor. And it was an independent company apart from the big railroad companies. Completely. Yeah. He, I think he was the sole owner. Wow. He later became yeah. the uh, United States Senator. Right. And I remember school was dismissed one What after was his name again? William B. McKinley. Wow. Grew up in, Famous born in name. Petersburg, yeah. Illinois. Right. Um, he. Uh, he came to town one. He was campaigning. He he was senator from 1920 to 1926, uh -huh. and he came to uh, Elkhart, I guess, campaign, and it was after school, and we went down to Main Street of town, and I remember him standing there talking to us. Right. And the only thing I remember him saying was, "In Washington D.C., I'm one of 96 people." Yeah. At that time. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um. So people could get, uh, there was an hour, every hour on the hour, they could go Almost, to Springfield, uh, yeah, St. Louis, I, Bloomington. I, I'd ride my Shetland Pony Beauty yeah. to town and tie it up behind the grocery store, right. get on the interurban, go to Williamsville to Dr. Sherrill, have my glasses checked, and go back the, all in one wow. afternoon, about maybe two hours. Yeah. And I, I remember 
the fare was something like uh, 15 cents or 20 cents. Wow. And That's by the great. way, the one of the motormen on that traction system was Jasper Oldsby, the governor's uh, oh, yeah? son. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. We'll probably talk about him in later, uh, later parts of the interview. Uh, was there, are there other towns around Elkhart that have a strong connection? I know Mount Pulaski is where they currently send their kids to go to school now. Was there always a strong attachment with, I know Cornland is another place I've heard you talk about. Cornland was a, a see, a Elkhart Township was a township and a half, and Cornland was part of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're in the same township. Mm -hmm. So you shared some governmental services mm -hmm. and units. And uh, my father served as the, uh, first of all, as a town clerk for the township, and then he served uh, as a supervisor. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, a lot of attachments to Mount Pulaski, or uh, was there a rivalry the, between the towns oh, in some bet. set? You, or, bet, you yeah. bet there was. Right. But more so with Williamsville. Oh, with Williamsville, <laughs> yeah. The president of the school board in Williamsville was Dr. Sherrill. Right. I can tell you a long story about that, but uh, uh, he was our doctor, and uh, Jaron Smith was our high school principal. And uh, we had the scarlet fever when we were freshman high school, and we were quarantined right. six weeks. Right. Well, Dr. Sherrill thought we should, uh, didn't need to be in that long, so he let us go out in about, uh, uh, I think, five weeks. We got back to school, and Mr. Smith said, well, we just got this place cleaned up from you, and now you're back to work. <laughs> so he called the state health department, and uh, the state health department called Dr. Sherrill, and he sent us back home. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Um, anything else you want to say about Elkhart and uh, its uh, kind of importance to you? And uh... The way I talk about Elkhart today is, and people get tired of hearing me, I say that, I'll say, do you know where Elkhart is? And they say, yeah, Elkhart, El Indiana. I said, no, Elkhart, Illinois. Well, where is that? Well, it's, um, the, the people in Decatur, I say, you know where Mount Pulaski is? It's 11 miles west of Decatur, or west of Mount Pulaski. It's about 18 miles north of Springfield and 11 miles south of Lincoln. It's the center of the universe. Yeah, there you go. And I mean, if, if you drive up 55, you see that, that hill. It's a very prominent uh, feature I wish, of the, in I fact, wish, the whole drive to Chicago, that's the, <laughs> that's the only hill I think that you see almost. Uh, L.B. Stringer, the uh, author of the Logan County History Book in 1911 yeah. described the Elkhart Hill. It's a beautiful description. Uh, yeah. And of course, later we're going to talk about all the sort of famous mm -hmm. families and the stories. Well, you of saw it when you were there a couple yes, of weeks ago. Yes, I very much enjoyed the tour you gave me of it. So, um, well, let's talk about your college years. 29 years in Elkhart, you moved to Normal. Sounds like to go to college or give it, pick it I, up from there. I guess. Well, in 1933, we graduated Milk Hart High School. Okay. I'll say Ray went to Blackburn College in Colville and had to give it up after a year and a half because of health. I went up to ISU and I did two years in upper elementary school grade. Okay. I did my student teaching in sixth grade at Illinois Salem Soldiers Children's School. Had wonderful, wonderful teachers. Where was that at now? Located? Illinois State Normal University. Oh, Il up in their lab school, yeah, what would be called well, a lab school now. They had two lab schools. They had Metcalf Training School on the campus, and then they had the Illinois Sailors and Soldiers Children's School out north of town in Normal. Oh, okay. And that's okay. where I did my student teaching. Okay. I was very fortunate. Not everybody got... How many kids were going to ISU at 1500. this point? 1,500. 1,500. Wow. And it, I think it calls itself the first public it's land first, grant university in Illinois. First, uh, state it was the first state, the first teachers college west of the Alleghenies, right. 1857. Right. And we're primarily teachers. We're celebrating our 150th anniversary this yeah, year. Right. And when you went there, everybody that was going there was primarily uh, uh, becoming educators, right? They or, were poor, all of them. Yeah. All of them, just teachers only. The whole, the whole university was devoted and to that. And they were poor people. Uh, depression. I only knew one person had a car. Yeah. Well, I finished uh, two years, and uh, I couldn't believe what happened. Uh, I took a job teaching Maple Grove School, which is a school I was supposed to go to when I was in first grade. Yeah. On the, really. Uh, on the Menard County, uh, Menard and Open County line. The uh, I had to have my license uh, in, uh, granted in Menard County. But the curriculum was under Logan County, right. so I'd have two certificates. Oh. That year was 1935, September 2nd, 1868. This said the building was built. Right. Had 18 children, seven first graders. Yeah. And uh, 
never had a better year. Yeah. Now it took you two years to get through just, ISU. It's just two years you got a teaching certificate. Okay. That, that, and, and you that, had to do some student teaching to get certified or? Uh, yeah, how did I, it work I did six on? weeks of student teaching. Okay, mm -hmm. right after your two I years. I did 12 weeks of student teaching, yeah. sixth grade. Uh, got was six, that considered a bachelor's degree later no, on? No, no, it was just called a, a teaching diploma. Okay, okay. Uh, it was, um, it was, I got $640 yeah. for that. Wow. And those seven first graders, I taught them all how to read, and one little boy. $640, we're talking about $640 a year. Okay, an annual <laughs> salary. I was going to make sure. <laughs> okay. And I got along. Yeah. So I picked up three children, the Brennan children, three of, two of them, and the Oregon children, and uh, five of them. One morning in January, we had this terrible, terrible, it was, it was the coldest winter on record. Yeah. And one morning. What year I, are we talking about here? 1936. Okay. I had those five children with me at 7 o'clock in the morning at the schoolhouse. I went to pick up my coal and cob bucket uh, to take, build a fire. And inside the building, t temp the, I looked at the temperature and said two degrees below zero. Yeah. But so the two, three boys across the road and Ralph Drake, the eighth grade boy, walked. And one little boy in first grade was brought by horseback. Yeah. And uh, very interesting. Last Thursday, just last Thursday, I went to Elkhart for a 85th uh, birthday observance of a uh -huh. friend of mine. Right. And there I met my eighth grade boy, oh, Ralph you're Drake. I, I had seen him before. He's 87 years old now. Wow. And he was at this school? He was my eighth grade boy. Wow. The, my oldest student. Right. How many kids were in that school totally? Maybe 18. 18. Mm -hmm. Okay. Had all grades except second. Okay. So wow. I uh, made cocoa for them and yeah. sometimes we could wow. take, uh, our parents would send uh, soup and we'd have soup. Right. Mm -hmm. So how long did you teach at that school? One year. One year. And then you moved on to? And how fortunate it was. Not wishing to brag, but it seemed like I got along pretty well. Right. And my county superintendent, E.H. Lukenbill, who knew me from first grade on, uh, he recommended that I go to be the uh, principal and sixth, seventh, eighth grade teacher in Emden, Illinois. Wow. Which is north of Lincoln. After just a year of teaching? One year. And I went there, and uh, what a wonderful experience. Yeah. I didn't have to build fires. I didn't have to drive in bad weather. Right. I stayed with a family named Whitaker. Uh, the board, school board members said to me, uh, well, first of all, it was August 11th, 1936, and I, Mr. Lukenbill called me at home. He said he had to see me. And I, I'd been in his office just on Saturday. I said, well, can't you tell me on the phone what you want? He said, oh, no, I can't do that. Well, I didn't want to go because the next day, my mother and my twin brother were going to go to Ohio, and we were busy. Yeah. So I went up, and he said, you're hired, you you got the job, but they need to look at you. So you need to go up there and and, uh, and see them. Right. So I said, well, I have to go home and put a suit on. He said, oh, no, just go the way you are. But I went home and put a suit on. My brother Ray drove me. We didn't know how to get there. Right. And uh, when we got there, we met Toby Rademacher, uh, who was one of the directors, and we met the... Uh, School board members. The school board members, yeah. Bill Hoffman, who was a railroad agent. Right. But the banker, Cyrus McCormick, was not available until 6 o'clock. So we had to wait until 6 o'clock to, to see them all. Yeah. And uh, by that time, I had a terrible headache. Yeah. <laughs> so we drove out north of Emden, and, and they were building Route uh, 30, uh, 136. We went back in, and we stood in, I stood in the center of this hardware store. And he said, Luke and Bill wants you to be the, super, the principal, and we take his word for it. He had, and he said, we're going to pay you $80 a month. And he said, we expect you to be in the building from 8 o'clock on Monday morning until 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon. What you do up between 8 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 8 o'clock is none of our business. And That's quite a raise from the 640 annual, huh? And he said, if, you, <laughs> uh, if we like what you're doing, we'll hire you and raise you each year until you get to the top. And I had the question, what's the top? <laughs> and he said, well, uh, we got plenty of money. Yeah. Well, the next, so the next year I got $7.50 raise a month. The next year I got $5.50 a month. And the next year I got two and a half. And in 1939, the teacher retirement system was changed from, uh, so we had to take a percentage. 
Up until that time, we were only paying into the pension two dollars a month for five months. Wow. In the next five for five years, four dollars a month for five months. Uh, next Let's see year. now, was Social Security kicked in by no, this time? No, no, we didn't. Uh, you didn't have to contribute. We to didn't. That. Uh, yeah. No. Uh, anyway, uh, we were guaranteed uh, a, a pension of uh, four hundred dollars a year if we for after twenty five years. But anyway, uh, I was there four years and had a wonderful experience where I met my wife. Now, tell me where that is exactly, from where you and were. Where you go, it's 120, uh, off, it's just a spur off 120 more, 11 miles north of Lincoln. Okay. So we're still kind of in Logan just, County. Just south of, yes, it yeah. is in Logan County. Just four miles south right, of Delaware, right. Illinois. So, so your first two jobs were in Logan County then, pretty well, much. I, yeah. Well, even in Lincoln, I taught in Lincoln yeah. too. Okay. Uh, so you are there for four years. In, uh, in, and uh, you were the principal and a teacher. Uh -huh. right. and we had three we had three rooms. I taught. We had a teacher who taught first, second grade, and one taught third, fourth, and fifth. And I taught sixth, seventh, and eighth. Yeah. And the parents were absolutely wonderful. Right. And I keep in touch with those boys yet. Some of them. Do you? Mm -hmm. Now, how big of a school was this? Uh, well, I had twenty-five in the class, and yeah. uh, uh, so maybe the, like we had uh, fewer than a hundred. Yeah. Okay. And this was an uh, you you taught at the elementary school level for the most part. I was part, there yeah. four years. Yeah. And again, I. Uh, and say the people were just unbelievable right. good. Right. Uh, I lived. I we had a basketball team. Right. We had uh, t took children to the. Uh, uh, they had chorus. We had a chorus. Right. And. Uh, did you uh, buy a house there, or did you just rent? No, I wasn't. Or? I wasn't even married then. Yeah. And how no, old we're talking about you? Were I was. Uh, I was there from 1920. I was, I was, Let's see, I went there when I was 22 years old, and yeah. I was there for four years. Okay, so you were very I, young. So and I you were the in, principal of the school. Yeah. yeah. Got a picture here. Let's see if I can find it. Right here we are. Oh, okay. So this was a gathering of uh, principals from, uh, and, then, yeah, uh -huh. and then there's a picture. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I still yeah. keep in touch with that lady. She uh, lived in Minnesota. Oh, yeah? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. We're both in our nice. Wow. Wow. And then this, of course, was my twin brother there. Right. But right. Uh, so anyway, I was in Mr. Lukenbill's office in the, in the courthouse in Lincoln one day, and I said, uh, Mr. Lukenbill, uh, you think there might be a job for me in Lincoln? And so he said, yeah, I'll call up. Nick, uh, Mr. Nichols, the superintendent, he called up Mr. Nichols, and, and Mr. Nichols uh, uh, had an office right across the, by, next to the railroad station. He said, send him over. I yeah. over and signed the contract. <laughs> and I taught sixth grade in Jefferson, which was on Fifth Street. Right. Forty-four children. Yeah. I taught there two years, had a wonderful experience, and in the next uh, third year, I was principal of Monroe School uh -huh. and, and principal and teacher. In Lincoln. And had 44 yeah. years, 44 children. Wow. And I decided that, well, 44 children is too much. Right. But in the meantime, I'd been going to summer school to ISU, uh -huh. the Illinois State University. Right. I went one summer to, uh, I went six weeks to Macomb. I did uh, 12 weeks at the University of Wyoming. Yeah. I went to ISU, Illinois State University. I got my degree in 1940 from Illinois State University, okay. a bachelor, bachelor degree. Bachelor's degree, okay, okay. And uh, that was 1940. Uh, While you were teaching, you 1940. Were you? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Then I, I took, I went to school at Teachers College in Columbia University, oh, okay. in New York. Oh, New York. New York what City. What years were those? 1941, 42, and 43. So you, did you have to quit your job in Lincoln to do no, that? No, I would go to summer school. Oh, you went summer school there. You spent your summers in New York. And um, I would leave in June, and I'd get back in August. And um, I kept a very accurate count of my record, my expenses there. Right. Uh, uh, a semester, uh, uh, a semester hour cost uh, twelve dollars and fifty cents. Yeah. And eight, uh, it cost ninety six dollars. I did my, uh, I. I I didn't have a lot of money. I only made eleven $1 hundred dollars, right. twelve hundred dollars. Yeah. So I had to be real careful with money. I kept a record, and I had the record. I I got my master's degree for something less than a thousand dollars. Wow. So in August of 1943, I um, got my master's degree, and uh, from New York, mm -hmm, oh. in New York yeah. Teachers College. Right. And fortunately, 
I was recommended to take a position to fill a year's leave of absence in Eastern Oregon University uh, okay. in La Grand Oregon. Okay. And I didn't want to leave Lincoln, but anyway, I did. Yeah. And so on September the 1st, 1943, I found myself in La Grand Oregon. Okay. So how many years were you both a teacher and principal in Lincoln then? We're talking from... I was, uh, I, I was a teacher for two years at Jefferson School, and I was principal and teacher at Monroe for one year, okay. three years altogether. Just to get back to those class sizes, 44. And nowadays we think 30, 30 is horrible. Well, I um, said... Why were there such Mr. Just Nichols, of financial? Mr. Nichols was a wonderful uh, superintendent, and then he left... And Mr. Augsburg, Harry Augsburg, became the superintendent. And I said to him one time, Mr. Augsburg, uh, the school policy says that you can't, shouldn't have more than 40. He said, well, they're here. What are you going to do with them? Right. So I just took right. them. There were no union contracts to rest restrict this kind you of never, thing back you, in those we, days? When we applied for a job, we never asked what the salaries were. They just told you. Right, right. Uh, I opened up a hot lunch program and uh, operated that and... Uh, it was, I'd be at school at 7 o'clock in the morning, leave at right. 6, right. work until midnight. Right. Um, when you lived in Lincoln, did you no, buy a home? No, or? I, I stayed with my parents. Oh, okay. Okay, you were... See, so I, I boarded, I stayed in, I, in Emden, and I, that was 25 miles from home. Right. Now, the day I'd drive it, but right. in those days, that was a long ways. Right, right. So, I, I boarded with a family in Emden, two families. And then Lincoln, I just drove back and forth to Elkhart with oh, my family. Oh, okay. And okay. then in, say, September 19... Forty-three. I was out in Oregon. I was supervising student teachers in the training school, and teaching sixth and seventh grade children. Oh wow! Well, it you was went a marvelous Lincoln. experience. Well, before we leave Lincoln, any anything more you want to say about your your years in Lincoln and your experience of living in in that community, or at least serving that community? You know, about the only thing I did was teach school. Yeah. <laughs> That's all so I had you time. commuted the back and <laughs> forth, and so you. Yeah. Oh, I went to movies once in a while, and yeah. and I I met let's say I met Rachel in Emden in 1937 and um, seven years later we got married <laughs> oh okay so seven years later but you met her there well was she a teacher there or no she she lived on a farm south of Elvin with her parents uh -huh. uh, well her father had died very young and she lived with a brother two brothers and a sister and uh, so we dated but our day she went in nurses training at the midnight okay. school of nursing in, in Bloomington. Okay. And so she graduated from school of midnight nursing in nineteen forty two. Okay. But I had no money. Yeah. And so our courtship was mostly by letter. Right, right. Well let's why don't we pick up on that and then we'll we'll pick back up on your career as you move to into Oregon. So you met your wife here in Illinois and uh did you what? When did you finally get married? After you your seven years. Well, I met courtship? her. In, I met her in January of 1937, and okay. uh, so uh, say we dated uh, not very frequently because I didn't have any money. Yeah. Uh, and then she went to nurse training. Then where did we she go to nursing training? Uh, Illinois State. Or she went to nurse training at the Mennonite School of Nursing in Bloomington. Okay. Bloomington. Which is now a part of Illinois State University. Oh, okay. Okay. In 1942, so she had finished her nursing degree and she took a job. First of all, a supervisor in the Mennonite Hospital, uh -huh. and then she worked as a surgical nurse with Dr. Gailey, the Gailey Eye Clinic, uh -huh. which is a big experience. So then I finished my degree, at, master degree in '43, and she'd been working a year, so I thought it was time to get married. Okay. And uh, so we planned to get married um, in 1944, but uh, because I went to Oregon, I said, no, I'm not going to wait until that. So we, I came back home uh, in December of 30th, 1943 and got married on December 30th in Emden. Yeah, okay. So um, then you moved to Oregon. Uh, we lived in Oregon. And we, the job in Oregon that brought you out there was a job at a university Eastern, or a college? Eastern Oregon University. Eastern, yeah. It was Eastern uh, Oregon College of Education. Now it's uh, Eastern Oregon University. Now how did you get hooked up with that job, or how did uh, you hear about the, it? The uh, Placement Bureau at Teachers College uh, recommended me. New York, mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. got your degree, mm -hmm. got your master's mm -hmm. degree. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it was a few years leave of absence, and with the possibility of staying, and I could have stayed. Right. It was a beautiful experience in that beautiful Grand Mound Valley, right. surrounded by mountains. Right. That summer before we came back home, we went with our minister and his wife uh, up in the mountains for a week's uh, right. camping trip. Right. But 
people say, why did you come back? Well, in the meantime, my mother-in-law had developed cancer, right. and my twin brother Ray was not well, right. and I didn't think we had any business being right. out there. Right. Well, I'm kind of surprised that you decided to take a risk and go all the way out to Oregon. That's a it was that's a big, a big step. move. It was yeah. a big step. My mother-in-law and thought. Now, remind me again. Did you get married before you made that decision? No, or I after? went in September and came back and got married in December. Oh, okay, okay. So you were just out there for. I was out there for a year. A year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Came back in July of '44. Uh, I want to be back home. Right. I'm a homeboy. Right. right. So we came back and spent time with our parents. And uh, in August, I didn't have any job. And in August, uh, I came down to Springfield for an interview, and I met with Dr. Files of the Superintendent Schools here in Springfield, mm -hmm. and he offered me a position in a school teaching eighth grade, and uh, for uh, nineteen hundred dollars. Wow! And that was pretty good money. Was that a typical way people got a job in the educational system? Was to come to Springfield and. Talk well, to the, the way I got he that. He was the state superintendent of schools, which in those days, was that elected or? State superintendent of schools, and that's a long story. State right. superintendent of schools was elected at that time. Right. No, no, no. Yes, they were elected at that time. Yeah, I think it right up until uh -huh, the, maybe uh -huh, the 60s uh -huh, or something uh -huh, like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, Prince G. Blair was state superintendent for many, many years. And um, I've, right now, I've forgotten the other superintendent. No. The Illinois Education Association, which has an office here on Edward Street in Okay. Japan, yes. Uh, that office recommended me to for this job in Springfield. Okay. And I came. Now, is down, that kind of like a teachers? That's a teachers. It's a union, teachers right? placement bureau. Oh, okay. Okay. And so I came down at the recommendation of the Illinois Education Office and was offered the job, but about an hour before I no, just as I was ready to leave home to come to Springfield, I had a call from the president. Of, uh, Pioneer State Teacher College in Wisconsin, yeah. at, at uh, Platteville, Wisconsin. And the president there offered me a job teaching 6th, 7th, 8th grade science and math yeah. and supervising student teaching for $2,500. So I said to Dr. Files, you know, just before I came down for an interview, I had this call from Wisconsin, and I said, I'd like to have until Monday to make a decision what to do. I said, right. I've been offered 2500 you're off me, 1900. He said, young man, if you say you're going to be in that building on the September 2nd, I expect you to be. I said, Dr. Files, I'm an honest man. Give me Monday to make the decision. So I, I, took, I, I went to Wisconsin. So you went to Wisconsin. You went for the, went for the money for once, huh? I had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> and so whereabouts in Wisconsin did you end up? Platteville is a, down in the well, southeast. That's where the Bears used to have their training camp, just that's over exactly, the border there. That's yeah. exactly right. And I went back up there uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and saw it. Yeah. The only thing there that I recognized was the um, post office. Yeah. The, the home which we lived, two homes which we lived in were down. Yeah. The, the hospital was gone. Uh, it was, it's, it's quite there. We had about, uh, oh, fewer than 1,000 students there. Yeah. But uh, wartime. But now they have about 5,000. So what years were you in Wisconsin? I was uh, in Wisconsin, 1944-45. Okay, okay. And, and, and again, did you were you married by this point? I, yeah, I, we were. Okay, yeah. so you brought your Been wife up first, to Wisconsin. And that's where our first child was born. Married, okay. Our first child was born there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this, by the way, is a... Did you enjoy those winters up in Wisconsin? This was our <laughs> wedding picture. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, so we, we what rent, were your impressions we, we, of Wisconsin for? Well, we rented, we rented a home, we rented a home for thirty-five dollars a month, furnished. Wow. And uh, it had an open a basement. Yeah. And we'd buy a quart of wood and a ton of uh, a quart of wood and a, a ton of coal about every two weeks. Yeah. And uh, we were we were broke all winter trying to keep warm. <laughs> yeah. But the temperature got down to twenty-three degrees. Yes. But it was a good experience. Right. So I stayed there one year. And now you taught. You just were uh, taught 6th, 7th, 8th again? or 6th, 7th, 8th grade, uh, science and math. Okay. Had small classes. Right. The easiest job I ever had. So it was like a, it was like a junior high almost because you were just yeah. teaching. Uh, it, was in, it was right in the college building. Right. And um, What's the college there in Plattsville? Pardon? What's the college there? It's, it's well, it's a. It's is it a, a branch of the University of Wisconsin? It is yeah. now, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I want to be back in Illinois, yeah. and I want to be a principal. Right. In the colleges, 
you're sort of isolated from your parents. You know, they say the college, they knew what they're doing, so we don't, I want to contact with parents. Right. And teach. So I came back and then I got a wonderful job. That in, was just an attitude that they had as college, well, in that particular setting? Well, I think it was, it was usually, um, you know, the college, is a, they look with respect to the college, and as the college says that they're doing a good job, that's all that's necessary. Oh, we don't okay. have to worry about it. Okay. So you weren't driven by a local school district, so or uh, we were employed by the college uh, gotcha. board of trustees. So it was a whole different kind the of The president, setting. the president, yeah, right, right. Dr. Noodle employed right, me. Right. Twenty-five hundred dollars. Right. And I could have stayed. Right. But I wanted to get back to Illinois. Yeah. Because I had uh, fourteen years back in Illinois. Yeah. No, I had more than that. So I came back to River Forest, Illinois. Oh, okay. As Chicago prim- area. I was principal. Right. Of a elementary school in River Forest, and no, no, no teaching, no teaching responsibility, just principal. Okay. Marvelous. And, and how did you find out about that job? You just uh, well saw it advertised somewhere, or uh, they had what they called the Hughes Teachers Agency in Chicago. Yeah. And uh, you gave your credentials to them, and uh, they found you a job, and you paid them, uh, I think, ten yeah, percent. Right. Right. So I had to pay to get a job. Right. I bet you were impressed with River Forest. That's a very impressive community. I was in the what you call the uh, see the, there's the North River Forest is where the very wealthy are, right? And South River Forest is where the okay, okay, <laughs> but, but, the more middle class. But people. my parents were uh, lawyers and right. doctors, right? And business people, and right. um, uh, it would be more like Oak Park, maybe. It, see, yeah. River Forest, you know, is uh, right between Oak Park and Maywood, right? And I was right there on Washington Boulevard. Ah, that schoolhouse built yeah. is torn down now. Really? I yeah, did. I went to went to a school on Washington Boulevard too, Emerson School yeah, in Maywood. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I'm very familiar with that area. Um, so how many years in River Forest? Four. Four years in River Forest as a principal of, of an elementary school. The name of the school was again Washington. Washington. Mm-hmm. Washington School. We lived in. <coughs> there's no. We had no. See, in 1945, when I went there. Housing was very tight. Right. So I, I couldn't find a place to live. Right. In Maywood, Oak Park, right. Park, no place. Right. Uh, Forest Park, they had no. Right. So finally I said to the superintendent who was new, uh, Dr. Burt, who came in from uh, Minnesota, I said, if, if I can't have a place to live with my family, I can't come. Yeah. So he called a meeting of the PTA at Washington School and right. said, look, we got a principal. But we don't have any place where I live. Right. Well, fortunately, up on 720 Keystone Avenue, okay. uh, a family, a dentist and his wife mm-hmm. had moved into a big, beautiful home. Right. They had a three-car garage apartment above. And for $50, we could have two rooms and a bath. And that's where we lived for four years. Wow. Not bad. Yeah. Did you... Uh, did you get involved in going down to the city of Chicago at all? Did you get? How did you? Did you mess yourself in the culture of the Chicago area at all? Well, or? the first thing we did, we, we joined. Uh, we, we always went to church in Wisconsin. We went to a Methodist church. Right. Where we were members of the right. Disciples Church. Right. But in River Forest, I we became active members in Austin Boulevard Christian Church on Austin Boulevard in in Oak Park. In Oak Park. Uh-huh. Oak Park. Right. And we were there four years, and we right. had a good experience. Right. Uh, with no money, see, it took all the money to live. Right. Uh, we didn't have a lot of social life, right. but we did too some nice things. We went uh, one year. We went to see uh, Sonia Henney at the uh, escapades and oh, yeah. and uh, at the Chicago Stadium. Mm-hmm, did mm-hmm, you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, uh, we met a, a man that became a good friend, and he had a boat on Lake Michigan. We we go boating on Lake Michigan, and, and the biggest. Do you experience, remember where you went in on Lake Michigan? Would you go right downtown to? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, we'd ride the Northwestern train in. Yeah. All right. And uh, that summer, I one summer I worked in uh, Mandel Brothers Department Store. Oh, okay. Where seven half cents an hour. Was that in Oak Park? Or Chicago. That was in Ch- downtown Chicago. Right on State Street. Oh my goodness! Mm-hmm. So you commuted down to State Street during the mm-hmm. summer to work. I bet that was an experience working downtown. I'd leave. I'd, I'd catch the train at eight o'clock and get down there and had to be in the store at nine and leave at five. Right. Eighty-seven and a half. Was the elevated started. started by then or? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. But the big experience we had, we went to the uh, Chicago Music Land Festival. Oh yeah. And our landlord at that time. We had this, uh, Dr. Boak was the landlord for two years, and then Homer Lang was a, a big, uh, he had a big floral uh, shop. 
Yeah. And uh, he, uh, he and his wife were socialites. Right. So they took us, we had our own take, we took us to the Chicago Music Lane Festival. And uh, instead of sitting out with the 80,000 people in the park. Uh, Do you remember where it was? Was it in Grant Park? Grant Park. Grant Park, yeah. Grand park? yeah. And uh, we ended up parking our car at the footsteps of the stage. Oh and we my. sat on the stage with all the dignitaries. <laughs> That's and, a good deal. I sat right, we sat right behind that great famous play, uh, famous um, So this would have singer. been at the, the Shell in Grant Park? Mm -hmm. The, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the guest artist singer that night was Robert Merrill. Wow. And yeah. I, we sat right behind him. Wow. And then after that we went over to the, uh, uh, I forgot which hotel, we went to a big hotel. Conrad Hilton? No, no? it would be on I forgot the name of it. Yeah. We went and we were there until 2 o'clock in the morning Wow. with the dignitaries. Yeah. Later on, uh, Robert Merrill sang at Kirkland Center in, in uh, Decatur, Illinois at a concert. Yeah. Yeah. And I went backstage and I said, Mr. Merrill, uh, you, I mean nothing to you, but I said, I remember you. And I said, uh, he said, how old? I said, well, in 1947 or 48, you sang at Chicago Music. He said, oh my God, yes. <laughs> He, you ever hear him sing? I don't. Th I, I recognize the name, but I don't think I've ever Great heard him guy. sing. Yeah. Um, you remember any restaurants or uh, other things in Chicago uh, that they stuck out a, in your mind, or did you become a sports fan of we, any degree? We we, we we did go several times to the Walnut Room in the, in the field. Yes, in Marshall Fields. That, that's the famous place. Right. Right. Uh, speaking of that, my first trip to Chicago was when we were in eighth grade. Quantas Club sponsored a trip for students going to Chicago yeah. in May of 1929. Oh boy. And we went by, it cost us $5 a half. Yeah, yeah. And we le left Springfield, we left Elkhart at about eight o'clock in the morning, got into Chicago at 12, and we had went to the uh, Walnut Room for lunch. Yeah. We saw the uh, Grant Park and the Shed Aquarium and, yeah. and Field Museum. Buckingham Fountain? Yeah. You remember mm -hmm. that, the, yeah? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, okay, great. So four years in River Forest, and then Decatur. You, then Decatur. Okay. Now uh, we're back in Central Illinois. Well, uh, because of a better in offer. In 1949, or? well, I loved River Forest, and the people were unbelievably good. We had Dr. Hughes was a great doctor. He and his wife. We just had wonderful, yeah. wonderful support. I've got to ask you because I I grew up in that area. Any connection to gangsters that you had when you were in River Forest? Because that's what we always remembered about <laughs> River Forest, was that some of the most famous gangsters of all time had their homes there. Of course, that was the part that you probably weren't serving. So. Uh, we stayed away from them. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but Tony Ocardo right. uh, had that big home in Central Oak Park, right. uh, River Forest. Okay. And his children went to school in Roosevelt School. And his children went to school in a chauffeur-driven car with a a guard that had two guns on each hip. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, of course, the story was that his home's plumbing system mm -hmm. was solid gold and yeah, and all black that onyx. Kind of, yeah. 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 Well, it's probably good that you didn't have to deal with <laughs> uh, <laughs> with we, that in we, your side we of just, Riverside. We just stayed away from them, but right, um, right. but uh, say in River Forest, and uh, we had doctors and lawyers, right. and uh, right. they were just marvelous people. Right. Right. Did you get involved in uh, principal associations and things in oh, the yes. Chicago oh, area? Oh, Did you get to know well, that's a lot a of whole, people that's up there? Whole, I was always involved. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so let's let's take you. You're now the Decatur. Why did you Why did you make the move from River Forest? Well, the you, chief, you lived in that apartment the whole the, time. The you were in River reason, Forest. Yeah. Two rooms. Yeah. <laughs> and how many? Up to two kids. One child. One child. Okay. Fifty dollars a month. Okay. The OPA office, uh, office of the Price Administrator, they wouldn't allow you to charge any more than that. Yeah. And we had wonderful landlords. They were good to us. Right. Um, Did you own cars during this oh, period? Oh, heaven, no. No? No, no. You could walk to school. And well, I only lived, uh, you know, uh, six, five blocks. Yeah. No, we had no car. Right. The chief reason we left River Forest, two reasons. Uh, I'd say I loved home. Right. I want to get back down somewhere to Lincoln. Right. And uh, again, uh, uh, the chief reason we, we did not have, we could not afford to live right. in River Forest. Right. And we wanted a home. Yeah. So I applied for, and, Link and Decatur at that time was uh, 
Well, right. didn't your salary kind of go up while you were in River Forest? Did they? I went from three thousand to forty-five hundred. Okay, well. But I moved to Decatur for five thousand. There, and and the cost of living between River Forest and Decatur, we're talking substantial. So we uh, rented in Decatur uh, the first year, and then we bought a little house. Yeah. And the only reason we could buy a little house, a four-room house, was because my mother. Uh, Law had died, yeah. and we got a little estate, okay. and that's where we could buy a house. Okay. So we bought our first house for eleven five. 11 and this five. is what year are we talking about? 1941. Uh, nine, we we went there in 1949. And we bought the house in 1950. Okay. And how'd you connect up with the Decatur job? Was it uh, again through an association or? He was teacher agency. Okay. Okay. Same I, place that got you the River Forest. And job. interesting enough, I became the principal of a uh, E. A. Gasman School which is right downtown. Right. And E.A. Gassman, after whom the school was named, was a superintendent of schools in Decatur uh -huh. for 47 years. Right. He was the first student to register at Illinois State University in 1957 and was the first graduate of Illinois State wow. University. Wow. And uh, I was principal there for one year and uh, grades kindergarten through six. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, I was principal there. For, I was principal there for three years. Yeah. But I also was principal the last two years in what they call Little Mount, a five-room school north of, of Decatur. Uh -huh. And uh, got along well. And um, fortunately, again, uh, I don't know how fortunate I was. Uh, we, um, they, I was invited to become an assistant administrator yeah. to elementary education. So I was assistant to the so the central office at the central office is in the Decatur high school, uh, public schools, and I was assistant to the elementary, uh, the assistant superintendent of elementary schools, and I served in that position for eight years. Mm -hmm. And we lost a referendum in 1959, and uh, we had five people were reassigned from the public school office. Right. So I went out to Brush College for four years, which is east of town. Right. And then I was at dentist school back on the west side of town for seven years and uh, eight years at Southeast School. Right. And uh, uh, in that meantime, I taught, I was visiting associate professor at Illinois, at Milk University. Uh huh. For oh, Milken? Yeah. Yeah. From 1958 to 1971. And you taught uh, what kind of classes out of Milken? Uh, Reading methods and child growth and development at American Public School. Okay. And I also supervised student teachers. Oh, okay. Okay. But you never went full time to the university setting. You always worked as a part time I had an adjunct or I had an opportunity. I was invited to, to join the staff at Illinois or at the Milligan by yeah. Dr. Daywall, but to do so would require that I get a doctorate degree. Oh, I see. So I enrolled at the University of Illinois for graduate school. And because I was past 40 years old, it wouldn't accept me. Oh, for a doc doctoral mm -hmm. program. Huh. So uh, how many years total in the Decatur school system? 30 years. 30 years in Decatur. 44 years total to all over. Okay, and you were principal in what schools? And Principal Gasman, Mound, Brush College, Dennison Southeast. And taught in what schools? I didn't teach you didn't teach at all. You were no, primarily no. a principal, mm -hmm. and then for a while an administrator. And the nice thing, one of the nice things about the care, it was, um, it was in, a, it was a period of change. Right. In the 1950s, without bragging, the care right. was recognized as one of the finest school districts in the state. Right. We had opportunities that we uh, never had. Decatur was an all-American city. Yeah. Had tremendous industry there, and, and from 1952 uh, to 1960, we built. Um, when I went there, we had 17 elementary schools, yeah. and in 1950, uh, 60, we had 27 elementary schools. Yeah. And the enrollment in Decatur in 1949, K through high school, was 11,000. Yeah. Uh, it went to almost 22,000 in 1969, and now it's 8,000. Yeah, right. Um, so you were there during this period when Decatur was Growing and then starting to contract. Yeah, very, very yeah. exciting, yes. Uh, we had a hard time getting teachers. One year at dentist school, we had to have two teachers and two different, uh, two, a teacher come in the morning and another teacher in the afternoon. Right. But the nice thing about Decatur, for me, it gave me an opportunity for growth that I never had any place else. Right, right. Because I could, uh, 
I was privileged to go to a national convention every year mm -hmm. with p expenses paid. So I became uh, very active in the Association for Childhood Education International mm -hmm. with our headquarters in Washington. Right. And as such, I attended a week's conference uh, for almost 18 years. Right. And uh, I served as Secretary Treasurer of the, in of the Association with headquarters in Washington. And I could go to Washington for board meetings. Right, right. And so I, I met in everywhere from uh, Washington, D.C. to Miami Beach to uh, San Diego, Los Angeles, right. Portland, Oregon, right. Chicago. Uh, during these years in Decatur, did you begin to become involved in civic activities in, in Decatur? Uh, and know, to what extent? Again, we, we maybe we'll talk about that more later, but just kind of. Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, we joined the church. Right. And we became very active in church and um, Central Christian Church. And we served as, my wife taught Sunday school and I taught Sunday school and was elder and deacon and all. Um, my feeling was if you aren't involved in the activity, you don't, you aren't, you don't, you don't really learn very much. Right. So I became very active in many organizations. I served uh, uh, as the uh, public relations uh, chairman for the South Central Division of IEA for a uh, good many years. Right. That was 11 counties. Then I was elected to the, to the board of directors of the Illinois State University, I mean, the Illinois State Education Association. I was, okay. a, I was a director of that in 1969 right. to 71 and served as the secretary treasurer associated with Child Education International in 1962 to 1964. Uh, Social Studies good many organizations right, right. and I served uh, very active in the PTA. Right, right. Um, over those years in Decatur, what do you kind of consider your major achievement of being involved with the school for all those years? <clears throat> That's a hard question. Yeah. Um, I have, the <coughs> I think <coughs> my greatest satisfaction was being able to, one of my positions was to help uh, orient the new teachers right uh, we would hire 50 new elementary teachers every year right and we'd have 500 more children in school in september than we had in may right uh, the other responsibility so my job was to help teachers to become better teachers right um, during the years that decatur was growing and then declining and you said at one point you consider the Decatur school system one of the finest in the state. It was considered that by a lot of people. What would you say were the elements that sort of uh, brought the school system down as the population went down in Decatur, as businesses left Decatur? Was it what what was it money that that hurt the school system the most, or the declining enrollments, or what uh, the quality of teachers you were able to attract? Or I hate to say it, but it was uh, integration. Yeah. Okay. Integration. Did you have a, a big lawsuit in Decatur that forced uh, uh, no integration no. like they did in Springfield? <clears throat> no, or? no, we didn't do that. Yeah. No, we we were we had the cooperation of the community. Right, right. But that you see, you can't legislate where people live. Right. So people now, when I was at dentist school, we had, uh, as I remember, only one, maybe one black family. Right. But when I left there in 1971, right. we had a good many. Right. And right now in Decatur, the, the, the uh, enrollment in K through high school is about 8,000. Right. And it, in most of the schools, the uh, population, the school population is 51% black. Right. So you're dealing with very high poverty rates probably. Very uh, high, and uh, they went. In the, the people moved out to Forsyth, Moroa, right. Mount Zion, Warrensburg. Did you see a decline in the active participation of parents and and? Uh, I went. Did it back make it harder <coughs> to run schools? I went up to. Uh, they renovated the building at Dennis right. School. I lived just a few blocks from Dennis School for good right. many years, and um, I went up to see the building, and I met with the principal, and I said. What kind of cooperation do you get from parents? He said none. Yeah. He said they won't even come to the children's school program. Right, and that's probably a dramatic shift from what you saw in your early years we, working we in the school system. Have, uh, we would have at Brest College. We would have 150 people at PTA meeting. Yeah, right. What and did the resources that were available have a major impact? You think, or 
because property taxes were, were going down and it was hurting the system in that no, way? No, I don't think. You, don't, no. you didn't necessarily mm -hmm. feel that that See, was we a had, major we factor? See, we had a big residential boom. We built right. a lot of on the outskirts. And right, right. Okay, okay. Um, anything else you want to say about your very many years in Decatur, uh, working for the district there and being involved in, in uh well, see, I was very, much, very, I, I was very active in the uh, in the uh, PTA and the Illinois Education Association, and associated with supervision curriculum development. Right. Um, no, it. The only regret I have in all of this is that uh, every Easter is when I was away from home. Right. Uh, in New York, uh, uh, Washington, or wherever you know. But with I had, your various associations. But you see, then. one of the things that was an opportunity for me to. Uh, grow professionally because I got to meet the greatest educators in America. Right. Became became good friends with some of them. Right. You want to talk about any of them in particular that were had a major influence on you or Well, uh, <clears throat> these, these were more like my colleagues, but right. uh, Dr. John Goodlad was the graduate of the University of Chicago with Dr. Robert Anderson and Dr. Goodlad uh, and Anderson both went to became professors at Harvard University. And Dr. Goodlad is still a uh, he came to care and talk with our PTA, and he is still an old man, but he's active in the University of Washington. Right, right. Uh, but you see, that was a thrill I had of, uh, we had to work hard, but that was a thrill of being able to associate with those people. Right, right. And we also were very active in legislation. Right. In fact, I served as the treasurer of the group committee that uh, worked to get the uh, uh, a non-elected state superintendent of public instruction. Oh, okay, okay. And yeah. I'm not sure that was a good thing. Well, I it's don't questionable. Know. Yeah, it is. I think it's probably debatable. One of the um, state superintendents uh, who served several years here was Dr. Robert Laniger. Right. Did you know who you ever knew? Yes, him? I and uh, I'm familiar with Ray Page, who I think was the last elected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and do you know that uh, Bob Laniger is from Elkhart? Is that right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I knew he was Illinois, though. Yeah, he was yeah. born in Elkhart right. and reared in Elkhart. Right, right. Knew his family, his parents when he got married. Right. Um, just to, to set up your family life, uh, you Decatur, you had the home, um, and uh, how many children did you end up having, and did they Mary go to the Decatur? Mary was born in Platte, Wisconsin, March 23, 1945. And Susan was born in August 16th, 1953, in Decatur. Okay. Mary graduated from Indiana University and Butler Masters and taught many years in uh, Indiana. Uh-huh. And um, is now retired from teaching, but she's also teaching in a corporation that teaches employees who go out and work in the, with a handicapped home. Oh, okay. She took a time out and went up to Wisconsin with a friend, another girl, mm -hmm. and they were up in Wisconsin for five years. Oh, yeah. Mary, uh, Susan, teach, Susan graduated from Western Illinois University, and she's been teaching. She taught in Waukegan five years, right. and now has been in uh, Mount Zion since 1980, right. and that's where she met her husband. Right. And He's also a teacher. I met him. Yeah. Well, he, he taught there two years, and he went to Clinton, and he just, Michael Bryant, he just graduated from, uh, he just retired from Clinton this year, uh -huh. but he's now working in, in uh, Mount Zion. And your wife worked in hospitals all this time, or? Well, when we got married, she worked in the hospitals in Oregon yeah. uh, for a few months because she had to come back home to be with her mother, who was very ill. Right. And then when we came back to, and say she worked uh, with the Gailey Eye Clinic in Bloomington uh, before we were married, but when we came to Decatur, she worked for 17 years uh, in the uh, Decatur Memorial Hospital. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you have a grand one grandson? Yeah. Uh, the, only, the only child I have, there he is. There you go. Uh, he graduated from Illinois State University. Oh, good. And uh, It's a long tradition with, uh, with ISU. And he... Uh, uh, he graduated. He, he's in his third year teaching uh, history and assistant coach in football at Effingham High School. Oh, Effingham. Last right. last Friday night, they played the third game. Yeah. Won all three of them. Yeah. And the big upset was that they beat by 14 to 13 uh, New Newton. Yeah. And Newton is a game that, uh, team that nobody ever beats. Oh, but boy. They did. Well, good for him. So he's on cloud Good nine. for him. 
Well, I think we're going to wrap up this session, and we got a lot of other things we want to talk about in session two. Well, but it's I, it's amazing the experience one can have in 93 years. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So, Roy, I appreciate you giving me kind of the overview of your life up until now, and we'll okay. we'll talk about some other subjects. We didn't talk about the homes we had, but um, we can talk about that. Sure. One thing I'd like to say about after I retired in 1979, uh, Mrs. Schilling didn't like to travel, and she wasn't too well, so I decided I didn't want to sit home all the time. So I took a job at our church as a uh, financial secretary right. uh, for a year. I stayed 15 years. Wow. Well, we're going to talk about your uh, period in after after you were an educator yeah, in Decatur because okay. you're 90 years old, so you've got quite a few years even after retirement. So, um, so I think we'll wrap it up right here and we'll pick it up again in session two. So, well, I hope I've done a good job here explaining oh, to you, you what my life has been like. But you're doing great. I always say the uh, I'd like to somebody said what 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 is the what do you have as a guy in light? Well. When I was at Plum University, I went to chapel service one morning, right. and Dr. Reinhold Niebuhr, who was born and reared in, Deca in Lincoln, Illinois, right. was a professor at the Union Theological Seminary, and I heard him s preach, and uh, so he is the author of the Serenity Prayer. Oh, yes. You know the Serenity I Prayer? I think I'm familiar with that. And uh, I've quoted that many times. God grant us right. the uh, serenity to accept the things that cannot be changed, the courage to change the things right. that can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And that's pretty important. That, that helps. And I always told my children, I don't care how bright you are and what you know, if you don't know how to get along with people, right. you're not going to make it. Those are good, uh, good words to live by. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Roy. Well, thank you very much.